nope, I'm okay. Thank you, though. Well, anyhow, welcome back to another episode of Oceans Apart. I am, as always, your host, Artem, and today we don't have the bear with us. We have someone even better and someone even bigger, our beloved Kyle Kusan. Kyle Kusan, I'm going to give you a little background. This man has uh, climbed Mount Everest just to get the milk of a very famous goat called Charlie. So he would use this milk on his face so he would get this shining, you know, blossom. And ever since then, he's been working as a model for um, GQ, and he's pretty successful, pretty successful, you know, it's uh, quite a remarkable story, but I'm not going to go too much into it, you know, he can introduce himself a little bit if he wants to, so, yeah, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit, maybe? No, that's all of it. Okay, <laughs> that's all of it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could follow that with something better, that's, that's pretty good. Just gonna silence this call from GQ. It's ever since that goat milk, they've just been on me. No, honestly, I got the inspiration of goat milk because of that thing I sent to you about uh, that like Instagram post where it's like just like, this goat milk, and then you have to like rub it three times. It's like just it's ridiculous like, the shit that people do. It's just oh, yeah, but wake up at two a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. If I can wake up at 2 a.m., read Gandhi's, you know, uh, notebook and just like uh, take a swim in the fucking Nile River. Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> but, but um, I, I feel like we could start off just like, you know, um, that you're a personal trainer, am I right? Yes, yeah. Okay, so then I have at least a question just on that, just to like start us off on that. Uh, as a personal trainer, um, like say you're an up and coming personal trainer, you want to, you know, get your own clients. Like, what is, like, how would you recommend for someone like starting up with something like that? You know, like, do you have any tips on how to approach it? You know, like maybe reaching out to people at different stores, or, like standing outside, giving out business cards, kind of, you know, just yeah. If you have any tips on that. Yeah. Um, so something people always told me, which is total bullshit, is to approach people in the gym. Do not approach people in the gym when they're working out. If I was working out personally and a trainer approached me, I that would really piss me off. Like I'm in the middle of my workout. Like why is this dude like interrupting me in the middle of my set, which are probably timed because I'm that much of a stickler about things. Mm -hmm. um, so do not approach people while they're working out what i would say is you have you have a resource that you know about and that's actually your hairdresser you're going blurry on me there sir yeah yeah you did as well there you go so that's okay yeah so your hairdresser is going to see the majority of people in your area if they're good and they also know other hairdressers giving them your business card and saying, Hey, like, if you want a session with me, you know, you can have either like a free session or 20% off or everybody you give my business card to that mentions your name, you're going to get a free session. So something to that effect, because they're going to see more people than you will. Mm. The second thing I would say is using the online base to get clients. Um, so in the gym, don't approach people, but you can advertise yourself. Like mm -hmm. in the bathroom, you can put an advertisement for yourself on the wall or something like that. Let them come to you. That's also going to qualify your prospects. It's going to show you that they're interested. You're not wasting your time text messaging people who don't respond or people who schedule an initial assessment that just don't show up. It's just going to make the funnel easier for you if you're getting interested people right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So two things. Um, Use your hairdressers and use advertising. The big no is to not approach people in the gym. Just don't do not do it. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually an interesting that you pointed out because I was just reading about, uh, I think, last week, um, kind of tips on this. And the guy literally says that, you know, say you're coaching someone in a gym or even if you're not coaching, then just like approaching someone that you see is doing something wrong and kind of like – you're correcting them and then you're just giving your business card maybe write down something on the back and then like okay i have to go back to my client but you know if you want any more like help just reach out to me like i kind of i can see how that could be a good thing because like then 
they look at you working with your clients, if you're working with your client, like at that specific moment in the gym. But I still feel that, you know, when you're in the gym, especially if you have headphones on, like you don't want anybody talking to you. And that's just like, it's like when you're in the gym doing your thing, even if you're resting in between sets or whatever, it's like you don't really want anybody to come up to you. It's just, it's, it's an unwritten rule. And like people who work out, they know that, but it's like still you have people who just kind of tap you on the shoulder and kind of like, hey, you know, let, let me like, talk with you a little bit. And just, honestly, that's the worst. So it's kind of interesting. And this was also recent, like post, this was like maybe a year ago, two years ago, like someone posted this. So it's, but yeah, but the thing with the headdress, though, uh, I never thought about it. That's a really smart one because it's kind of very broad population he can also reach to because he has people coming for, you know, haircuts from all age groups and all um, lines of work. So that's actually, that's a really good one. I, I like that a lot. That's a, that's really, really good. I like that. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I made the mistake <laughs> myself where I was approaching people in the gym and I was wasting a lot of time and I wasn't really getting a lot of results doing it. Um, and if you're going to go up to somebody in the gym and they actually want to talk to you, you got to ask yourself, do I want somebody who's going to talk during their workouts a lot? Like for me, I wanted more like athletic people, people who were serious, not mm -hmm. somebody who was just coming in because, you know, they needed a friend. Mm, yeah. Um, and I also don't like looking like I was desperate. Like, I think in a way, if you go up to somebody while they're working out, like you're showing you're desperate. And I'd rather have people feel like my time is urgent. So, like, they need to apply to work with me. Yeah. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with that. Because that's the thing, too, what I was thinking about, which is that if you do reach out to people like that um, in the gym, for example, you go up to them, it kind of shows that, like you were saying, it's like, it shows you're desperate. And then it's, but then it's like the thing is, you know, you might have like zero clients at the moment and you kind of are desperate, but you have to pretend like you're not desperate. And that's like, it can be tough, you know, and there's going to be days where you're like, fuck, like I just, I need some clients, I need to earn money. But I feel that if you're patient enough, it's going to come, but it's, it's a slow process. Of you get like maybe five, 10 clients and you can work with them. They're going to start telling their friends, they're going to spread the word around and then slowly, slowly, you're going to build yourself a base and kind of go somewhere. But it's, it's that initial um, takeoff, you know, having the patience and just believing that, like, my time is worth it. And it's also the thing I feel, um, price, it's like where you don't want to put the price as well, like, that people pay you extremely low, like, compared to your competitors. And they actually don't want to put it, like, too high. It's kind of like you need to put it, you know, based on how you value yourself and, like, your knowledge base and kind of how you feel that. And then if people think that's too much, then it's like, they're the wrong person for you, perhaps, kind of thing, you know? Yeah, for sure. Pricing is difficult. Um, yeah. You definitely, like you said, you, you want to start your base up, get some regulars, and then you can work out. I think the biggest thing in the, in the beginning to work out is your schedule because when you don't have anybody, mm. like you said, you there there is a little bit of desperation because that's how you get paid, right? So. Yeah. You're scheduling like two guys in the morning and then two guys in the afternoon um, and it's everywhere. So like closing that window where you could see six or eight clients at one shift in the gym first, like five days a week. And then, you know, one year being there, you could just tell them, look, my prices are going up. You guys are going to be grandfathered into the price. I just wanted to let you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, but you're developing that reputation. And once you have it, you know, the price really doesn't matter unless you work in Boston because apparently people pay $300 for a gym membership there. So wait, is that like a month 300 or like for the whole year? No, that's like a month. Like, wow. Okay. <laughs> Damn. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Equinox dude, not trying to put them down or anything, but they, they're, they're a pretty phenomenal place because they have, like, your barbers and everything involved yeah. there. But their prices, just to be a member, not including personal training, it's, like, more than 200-something a month. So Jesus Christ. Damn, man. <laughs> but, yeah, that, that, that's what I mean, though. It's kind of where, you know, they probably build themselves a base and kind of, you know, just for that. But, yeah, I, I don't know, man. That's, like, very... 
I feel it's also a very narrow group of people you can reach with that because not a lot of people are going to be willing to pay $300 a month. Like even in, including everything, you know, the barber and like all the benefits of it. It's just I feel that's still, that's a lot of money like a month just to go something like that. But hey, if it's working for them, it's working, you know, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not including training, by the way. Just yeah, that, that's what I mean, man. That's just that's that's ridiculous. That is really ridiculous. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but okay, like just going off on this, like um, another question I'd have for you is, um, so say you've you've reached, we've gone past the day, you know, the process of getting clients. Now you have clients, and say it's their first time coming to you. Um, do you have? Uh, kind of like a template of like what you would do the first session with them or is it kind of just individually based or you know yeah uh so everything i do is individually based i typically will assess them so they've res they've responded to your ad and mm. they agree to that initial consultation within that consultation um they would have done the park you prior and if they forget to bring it, then they'll do it there. Um, and you'll do some sort of assessment, like postural assessment, FMS, whatever you like to do. Mm -hmm. You're going to understand what level of movement they're at. And then for that first session, after they sign up for whatever the package is, you'll have some sort of idea of what to do. Um, I do have templates, but for somebody who's starting out, they probably wouldn't. The only reason I have templates is because, look, I have a person I've worked with who's very similar to a new person I just got. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try and give them uh, the same program, but switch up maybe three exercises and com give them a completely different warm up. Mm -hmm. um, something to that effect. But a new trainer probably won't have that. And that's why it's good getting those clients, because it's going to streamline the process. You'll get better. Just save all the documents you make. Uh, save all the workout programs you make and then you know that learning curve between you and the new client just becomes very very small mm -hmm. so yes and no but as a new trainer you're not going to have a template it's going to be all specific at least it was for me mm -hmm. no yeah that, 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 I like that though I like that because because I'm thinking you know that it's a good thing to have a template, but then again, you know, everybody's different. Even if you have someone that's like very similar to somebody else, like you were saying, like that didn't, you still would change a few things and you have a different woman with them because at the end of the day, you know, even though they might be kind of had the same starting point, they're still a different person because you could do the same thing with two people and you can have two different results. So that's the thing that's very important to keep in mind, I think. And yeah, but that, that's, I like, I like that though. I like that, man. Um, but, um, but you know, and um, so, but what is your go to then? I just right. What is what is your, what is your go to um, the first session? Like, do you do like do you look at the FMS? Do you do kind of like something else? But what is your go tos? I look at static posture. Okay. Um, and honestly, it, it's not even really an assessment, but their job to me is one of the biggest indicators of what they need to be doing. Because if there's somebody who sits in a desk eight hours a day, mm. um, not only will their posture reflect that, but that just that alone told me what muscles are overactive, what muscles are underactive. Like they're in, they're in a roll forward position. Like, you know, I'm not going to sit up straight for eight hours a day. And I know how destructive sitting is on the body. So, you know, they're not going to sit up straight for eight hours a day. Yeah. Um, Static posture. I look at squatting. If they, you know, if their knees aren't injured, um, I like the trunk stability push up from the FMS. Mm. A and then other things I'll do is probably related to like injuries they've had or things that are relative to them. I don't go through a whole FMS. Um, the reason why is because I don't do it the way it's meant to. Like the FMS, you're not supposed to analyze anything. Mm -hmm. in an assessment i want to know what's overactive and underactive so doing an fms would do me really no and them no justice because i'm not following the reason it was made mm. no yeah I, I definitely agree with that definitely because i think the fms 
it doesn't do a pretty good job of just telling you exactly where that person stands in terms of fitness or just you know how they are because yeah that's kind of I feel like that but do you then again on, on top of that like you do the same well actually no you wouldn't do the same thing right you know depending on the client like because you know yeah well everyone i see will have some sort of assessments that are different yeah but everyone i see will go through three assessments with me um a static postural assessment from the front and side view so i could see that everything's built off of posture mm -hmm. um they'll do a squat because that's a fun fundamental movement pattern that i think everybody should be able to do mm -hmm. um even even basketball players like it may not be great but uh, and they're going to do a trunk stability push-up because that shows me how tied in their core is to their extremity, how well they can radiate from core to extremity, proximal to distal. Okay. And, and then I would add additional things based off of like injuries or whatever. But those three things are, are pretty much going to be the same for everybody I see. Okay. Uh, but with the squat, though, like, would you then like, just... Um... Like are we talking barbell squat or just like a simple bodyweight squat and then yeah. Yeah, simple bodyweight squat. Um if they can, there's no pain, arms overhead. Mm. NASA calls it the overhead squat assessment. I like it because they have a template, it's very simple to follow. It just says if this happens, these muscles are overactive, these muscles are underactive, and here's what you should do. Yeah, yeah. So it's just the plug and play at that point. And, you know, I, I like ease of access. So yeah, I'm studying the stuff and I should probably like people could tell me I should probably know it anyway, but it helps to have the sheet just to be like a, a reference and a reminder. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree with that. Cause I feel that even though, yeah, you're studying like you might've been doing it for a while, you know, it's like sometimes it's also just good to have the sheet. Like for example, that uh, as a visual, like even if in the, I don't know, you know, like, would you show it to the client, you know, kind of what the results are? Or like, would you maybe stray away from that? Or, yeah. What? No, I would explain the results and what I think should go from there because it gets them to buy in to you and you're building trust. Like, mm -hmm. you're basically anticipating them asking why if you explain mm -hmm. the results to them. So right off the bat, you've um, you built some trust with them and you're building buy-in so they're not going to come in and do some exercise that they think is silly and be like wow this sucks like why am i doing this this isn't fun mm. okay yeah no that, 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 i like that because the thing is like i feel that like sometimes you know um some people like i know some people kind of stray away from say they do an assessment and kind of showing the results maybe just like telling them like oh like you're maybe this or this you know instead of like, actually showing them because i feel that like, Showing them might be a good thing in that um, they, because a lot of people also are better at like the visual learners. So it's kind of just mm. easy to just like show them exactly, okay, so this is like what I got from this. This is what it's telling me. So they also understand it from your point of view. And then if they want to know more, you can go into even more deeper details if like that. But usually like it might just be enough just explaining them, okay, this is this. And this is like what's this causing and putting you into this position. And we're gonna do this to like where these things to help you get out of that. And that's like make it's also I've I've realized though I didn't um I learned this during the summer during mentorship is that it's really good to tell the person when they come in kind of what the layout is almost immediately so they know what's happening. So like okay, we're gonna warm up for five, ten minutes and then we're gonna have you do this and then we're gonna do this, this, this it's kind of instead of having them because I think that way it's kind of easier for them because otherwise they're like what is guys kind of they're on the toes of the time they're like what's gonna happen now we're gonna warm up now and what's happening next it's kind of just they didn't know exactly what's doing like okay we're gonna warm up we're doing some strength work then we're gonna do some maybe bring a panel or something like that and then we're gonna cool down just so they have a plan in their head and it kind of it helps them relax at, at least is at least I've, with some I've, I've, i felt that with the clients i did this summer their mentorship and like having now but i don't know like, do you feel differently or would you agree on that yeah, I agree. Um, it, it's tough because some people, they're going to feel like when you do an assessment on them and you explain the results, they're going to feel like they're a sack of shit of a human being. Because if your movement's bad and you're just like saying, oh, yeah, uh, your squat, well, that kind of sucked. Um, 
you couldn't do a push up and uh wow like you basically look like a king because your kyphotic curve is that bad yeah. like <laughs> You, you can't do that to them. So you just got to say, like, right before the assessment, what I tell them is, like, look, everything that we do gives us a baseline because I'm trying to make the best program for you, right? Like, that's your elevator pitch. Like, the reason why people fail, they yo-yo diet, they don't hit their goals is because they try to follow this cookie-cutter program from somebody they that asked them five questions about their lifestyle and it didn't work, they got injured, what have you this program is built for you. What we see is not on a scale of good to bad. What we see is just like either it's effective or not effective and we can move on. We can work to make it more effective. Mm. Um, so what I'd like to do is assessment one, two, three, and then afterwards we'll talk about what we see and what the program looks like going forward. Mm. I find more often than not, if you explain it like that, um, you end up with a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. And like, like Mike Boyle says is that he uses the FMS just to stress how much he knows. Mm. Like I don't use the FMS, but I do agree. Not with everything he says, but I do agree with that statement. Like if you're doing an assessment, you have conviction and you have like knowledge about why their knees are caving in and you can explain that to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to make you look smarter. So you're building that know, like, and trust right away. Mm -hmm. No, I, def I really like the part about you talking how, um, in the beginning, how you tell them that's like, this is like a baseline. Because otherwise, I feel if you don't do that, it's, as you were saying, that it makes them feel like crap about themselves. Like if they couldn't do, for example, any assessments or they did really poorly on something, and they will know that they did poorly on something just because it's, they know how it's supposed to be done probably and then how they're doing it so but because yeah because the thing is like that's i really like that in the beginning saying that because i've usually just like had them do something and then um afterwards like that was shit or, like i just feel like this and i'm like now nah, listen like i've seen much worse like i i am even worse than you kind of like almost trash talking myself kind of a little bit but i feel like that your approach i like your approach much better that in that it's it makes them also feel mm, valued and important in that you know you're telling them like okay this is a basin this program like we're going to just it's kind of like going to a tailor and getting like a suit tailored for you like it's specifically fit for you this is like all for you like it makes them also feel good it's like because it's like it's one thing to buy just a suit and get a program it's like forever but like getting a tailored suit is like a whole different thing it feels differently and same thing with this program like they won't feel it immediately but they kind of get that feeling in that oh this is for me and like it makes them feel really good about themselves and then yeah, and maybe maybe it's also like a little bit of placebo in that the economy feels good and like the program, not to like discredit anybody, like the program might be shit, but because like they feel good about it, it's like they're doing it, like they might work together or something. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm just like playing with thoughts right now, but um, yeah. But I really, like, I really like your approach though on the um, assessment thing in the beginning, like kind of you know telling them and making them feel good about themselves. Yeah. I, I always thought of it like when I went to physical therapy, this guy that I never met before, he introduces himself, doesn't tell me anything about him, walks into the room, and then he just starts doing these assessments. He's like, resist my hands this way, this way, lift your arms overhead. And then he goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, and takes notes. And then he does another assessment, uh-huh, uh-huh, takes notes. And then he's like, all right, see you in 10 minutes, and walks out of the room. Like, all right, so – that that could be a similar process that our clients are going through. So maybe just involving them in the process is the way to go. Um, so that's why I kind of took on that approach. They, I find that the more work you do up front to get them to buy in, um, the easier your relationship is with that person. Mm. Like, so the first eight weeks with a client, I'd say should be your hardest and most dedicated weeks. Of course, you're always dedicated to them, but like you want to really focus on strict form and explaining the why behind everything, because when week nine comes and they trust you, you just say jump and they say how high like they don't they don't question the exercises anymore. They don't mm. they, they know that you have their best interest at heart. Mm.
Yeah, I really like that. But the, the thing about that, though, um, when you do, for example, say you're going to coach them through, um, like, say, like a single arm, you know, dumbbell row, for example, um, like, how many, like, do you cue them a lot or do you just give them, say, one or two cues and just let them go at it and then see how it, how it goes or uh, what is your approach to it? Yeah, that depends. <laughs> Yeah, like like I I hate saying that depends because I you could say that for every question in this industry. Yeah. But some people that you have, they want to think, they want to know the why behind everything, and they want to know what they're supposed to be feeling. For those people, I give them, I just like inundate them with cues. I basically try to talk them through the exercise without even showing it to them. Like I I, I explain it as if you could read it from a textbook and then imagine the movement. Mm. For other people where thinking is like analysis paralysis kind of thing, mm. I give them maybe one or two cues. Those are the people that are working like 60 hours a week and they have four kids and they're just so stressed that, um, you know, telling them 20 things is going to look like an obstacle that they can't meet. And they probably didn't hit a deadline at work. So that's just adding to their level of stress. Mm. So for those people, I may even just give them one cue. Like I, I would show them me leaning over the bench and I'd say, just reach down as low as you can pull your elbow back as far as you can. Simple. Mm. No. So yeah. shitty answer, but that's basically what I take into account. <laughs> no, that's a good answer though. Cause, um, um, I have a tendency of almost over explaining things and that's kind of where I've, I've started to draw back on that where it's, I just, if I, I, no matter who it is, I always stick to one or two cues just to keep it simple and then can almost let them also something, because even if they're doing it wrong, I almost let them try and figure it out themselves. Cause like sometimes, you know, I'll, like for example, with the single arm down the row, like they'll do it and then they might change their feet positioning or they might start correcting their hips or kind of like the torso. And then just like, they'll feel themselves through it a little bit as well, you know, and if, I, if you're doing it, and it's like, I'm, you know, it's just stay the same, almost getting worse. Then I'll go in, okay, like, you know, fix this thing, you know, or something like that. But I almost just like try to then also like not to overdo it because I feel that by putting so many cues, um, it can also have them be thinking too much. And then they're just now not even focused about anything. It's just like, oh, I'm thinking too much instead of just actually doing the exercise. So the, that's, that's the thing too. But that's a, it's a good point though in that, um, because I never thought about that and people who are very stressed, you know, and they're kind of keeping it more simple for them because they don't need that additional, just all these cues. It's just more information for them or just, it probably doesn't even go in. It's just like, they'll take it in and it just goes out immediately because they just have to in the back of their head, like maybe work, you know, a deadline that's like that day that needs to be done or something's going at home, personal stuff, work, whatever it might be. So yeah, that's actually, that's a, that's a, interesting point like i've never thought about that but i'm still gonna stick with my though like one or two cues because i feel that if they can't do that and then if they do themselves a little bit it's just it's better to maybe just move on to a different exercise because perhaps they're not ready really for the exercise at that particular moment yeah my way is probably wrong like i don't think there's a right or wrong way to really cue people like the textbooks are like oh yeah the less cues you give them the better but what i noticed is when i was in amherst a lot of the people i trained were harvard alumni and specifically that group of people they they asked question after question after question during an exercise so i just started like i don't want to say putting them in boxes mm -hmm. but from that point on when i realized the trend Whenever I got a Harvard alumni, I was like, all right, I'm just going to explain like as much as I can about this exercise. They like to feel it. They like to know the why. They like to know the angles of the joints, like everything mm. in, in the demo. Mm. Um, but again, like, you know, Dr. T, he's way smarter than I'll ever be. And he goes with your approach, you know, like less cues, the better. You don't want to inundate them with cues. I think that you're always trying to like find your style, your voice, and you're tailor making it to the person you're with. There's so many gray areas. Yeah. Um, that's my approach for now. And if you ask me in a year, I might change it. No, <laughs> yeah. Know? Even if you ask yourself in like a month or even two weeks, it might be changed. You know, so it's 
But um, yeah, because I think I do, I, do, I do agree with you in that I've noticed um, that general pops, they're usually asking a lot of questions. They always want to know why am I doing this? How, like, kind of join angles? Like, what is the best way? Like, what is this going to help me with? Et cetera, et cetera. Well, I feel with athletes, it's more do this and they're like, okay. And then just doing it. Like, they don't really ask. Like, sometimes there's a few who do ask, but the majority just, you know, they just I don't know, put so much trust in you. Like, they're just more focused on their actual sport than like thinking about, you know, how to pull, like how to do this or this, like in the proper way. Well, like what Jen Pop is like, they're more concerned because they're not really occupied with anything like with a sport or something like that, you know, because I feel like with athletes, it's like they don't really, they know that the gym is important, but they care more about, you know, correcting things on the field or the track than actually correcting things in the yeah. gym because that's going to be more applicable for them, you know. So it's, but for, for gym pals, it's like more applicable to correct things in the gym because if they do those things correctly, it's going to help them, you know, with their everyday life, like playing with their kids or painting the house or you know, even building a house or a summer cottage or whatever it might be. So I definitely feel as a, I think you said it yourself, it's a place and time for it, like, like as the Harvard, you know, alumni, for example, like they, for those, that specific population, like you would queue more, well, for a different population, you wouldn't, so it's, you know, knowing who you're working with as well, and, yeah. But, I, I, just a quick on that, like, that's the thing too, I feel that I, I noticed, because um, this summer was like the first time I was working with Gen Pops, like actually working with them, and that I noticed that, um, you really have to, as like, if they walk in for the first time, it's like you have to be very quick on reading them and kind of who they are as a person. You know, like it's kind of, is, are they, you know, do you, this might sound really bad, but it's like, are they kind of more from the suburbs or the, you know, finer parts of the town or living in the city? Because you talk to them in a different way. Like if you have someone who's uh, foreign, like at least for me, like I'm foreign, so like I talk to someone who's foreign and from the suburbs in a different way, kind of as a more like a friend, as a buddy, like, hey, what's up, bro? Like, la, la, la compared to, say, someone who works, who works in a company and, you know, is maybe like a CEO or something like that, you know, like I would be more polite with him, you know, like that. So, and this is like just amazing. Like, you know, with females, it's like a bit different like that, but it's like being really quick on reading that and then just going off on that, you know, and I feel that's a, a very good skill to have and that it helps you and it also makes them feel good because then it doesn't get this like this awkwardness where they might feel like this is this quiet and they're just doing their thing and it's like, Maybe they want that as well. Like you never know. So it's, again, about reading often really quickly. And I feel like that can be hard, but uh, I think you can develop it just through experience, to be honest. Yeah, you definitely want to be a chameleon. And at the same time, you don't want to not be yourself. And yeah. that's always been very, very difficult for me to, um, to master. Mm. But you get better as you go, like you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, another topic that I want to talk about is because uh, I know that you are kind of the well the expert of us three. We don't have Declan here today with us, but um, pain and kind of you know training around pain. Um, I don't know. You can just kick us off with that. Like, do you have you know just what's your thoughts on that? Like, you know, do you have any tips or thoughts? Anything? Yeah, just, I'm just gonna let you do your thing right now. Yeah, I mean, I find personally the reason that I went this route is because I have pain, like, everywhere. I did mixed martial arts from 8 to 18 years old, and uh, we didn't use pads when we sparred, so I have all these nice little bone spurs and bruises and bangs, and when the weather gets cold, I don't move as well. Um, And I also have nerve damage that I was born with that restricts my movement and my own theory is that I'm developing scoliosis from it. Mm. But I find that it's very, very demotivating if you have pain or you have an injury to go into the gym and you have to scale like every single exercise or regress every single exercise or you can't do the CrossFit workout as written. You have to do something completely different um, or you end up spending 40 minutes doing a warm up of corrective exercises because you're this delicate little flower that, uh, you know, just, just needs it because that's how injured you are. And I'd say that 
there's it's it's simple um, to train around pain, and I don't want to say it's simple to fix your pain, but typically the steps you would take to train around your pain may actually mitigate or decrease that level of pain that you experience. Mm. Um, so basically that looks like first identifying the movements you have pain in. It sounds simple or common sense, but it's actually not like you want to take a detailed detached look at yourself, what movements, do I feel pain in? And you may not even know all of them off the top of your head until they come up in like a CrossFit workout or like a workout that you're trying. Um, when they do come up, just write them down because you're going to forget them. Just let's, let's just get that clear right now. Like you're going to forget all the movements. <laughs> you have that list whether you carry it in your gym bag and, you know, look at it every day look at the whiteboard at your CrossFit gym or look at the program that you're doing and make sure that none of those movements um, are there. If they are, substitute them out. Um, the other thing that would help to train around pain is your lifestyle. So when we were talking about personal training clients before, mm. I mentioned it's critical information for me to know if they sit in a desk eight hours a day. Mm. Um, if you're one of those people and you have shoulder pain, it's not difficult to understand why. Like if you're rolled forward and that small, small gap uh, that allows your joint those degrees of freedom is touching another bone or is closed in any way, you're probably going to have pain. You're probably going to be rubbing some sort of connective tissue or what have you. So you want to get back into an extended state if you're in a naturally flexed state. So that postural assessment is really huge because we're not only looking at the upper body um, for kyphosis, but we're looking at, you know, anterior pelvic tilt or posterior pelvic tilt. Mm -hmm. That pillar of your body is where everything comes off of. That's your foundation. Things radiate from core to extremity. Any movement that matters, right? Barbell curls, may, maybe not so much, but... Um, so fixing, you when I get chicks, man. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> fixing your posture is, is going to also um, eliminate pain. So when you're doing your warm up, you don't want to get caught in that rabbit hole of, oh, I need to fire my glutes and I need to work my individual muscle fibers because they're shut off. Uh, Focus more on the, the biggest bang for your buck in sense of if you're in a flex state, getting back into like a balanced extended state, or if you're in like an extended state, because that's possible, especially with athletes, you want to get, you want to add a little bit of flexion into your life. You want to get, you know, you basically want that, that line, that mm -hmm. nice um, mild S shape of the spine and, you know, that nice level playing field of the pelvis. Mm -hmm. and shoulders that aren't really rounded forward. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't really seen shoulders rounded back, but um, <laughs> shoulders that aren't rounded forward, you know. So returning balance to your body is also going to, I could say with a lot of certainty, mitigate some degree of pain, mm -hmm. if not all of it. So um don't spend, you know, 40 minutes doing isolated exercises for your like right digitorum wrist extensor. Um, don't, you know, spend 50 minutes humping a foam roller when you get into the gym, mm -hmm. you know, three or four exercises that are going to return you into either that balanced flex or bal balanced extended state. Mm -hmm. And then don't do the exercises that caused you pain. Those two things over time, um, for me personally, I've had success with myself and with my clients who've experienced pain. Mm. Yeah, no, I definitely, um, I really like that. Um, the only thing though I have is that the thing about pain, I feel like some, do you, do you feel there's ever a moment where, um, say I feel pain in my shoulders when I'm doing like overhead presses, for example, um, do you feel there's ever a moment where that, you know, even doing the exercise, even though you're feeling pain, is a good thing. Because I feel like, take for example, maybe you're rehabbing or something like that. 
like in my own opinion, like my own experience, it's like sometimes you just, it's going to be uncomfortable in the beginning, but if you keep doing that and just working like through the range of motion, um, it's going to help to build muscles around that um, specific joint. But uh, like, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, as a fitness professional, I don't cue anybody to work through pain. It's mm -hmm. that, that area kind of, that, that's like a fine line that kind of scares me because it's a little bit out of my scope, and uh, I also don't have the knowledge of a PT. I'm not in PT school or anything like that, so I don't know with certainty. What I'll say to that is it's important to know the difference between pain and fatigue. And sometimes in smaller muscle groups, the fatigue is so acute that it, it, it disguises itself as pain, but it's really not. And the more you develop that mind-muscle connection, you're going to know all right, if, if this is feeling hot and it doesn't feel like it's grinding, mm. then that's that's a level of fatigue, mm. all right? But if it feels like it's really just grinding and it's almost like the size of a tip of a pen, then that's pain and, and I should stop doing that. Mm. Um, I know that PTs do tell certain people to work through pain. I just don't like to enter that area because uh, it's it's dangerous. I don't want to hurt anybody, and uh, I also don't want to get sued. So, you know, it's a win-win. <laughs> yeah, dude, getting sued is not, yeah, that's not gonna be fun if that happens. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely, because um, yeah, because I'm I feel I'm very you know in between on that, because in one sense I think it's like you need to like, work through pain, and then you you bring a really good point about you know between fatigue and actual pain, and. Um, that's like a weird thing. It's like sometimes hard for people to know the difference between those two. And then also feel like looking at a client when they're working out, for example, it can also be a difficult task to say, like if they, they might be saying like, ah, oh, like this is hurting, you know, but you know, it's like, do you stop them right there? Or like, do you continue? It's like, uh, it's, it, it, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's very fun. Cause the thing is like, I even have a funny story on this where, uh, this woman, she came, she came in, and then um, she was supposed to go. I think that weekend, like hiking somewhere, and all I had her do was just simple, because like she was like, like she had something with the lower back, and like she, I, I don't even know, but like, um, yeah, so like I have her just do very simple stuff. Like we're not loading the back end, and just like we start. I think what we were doing was uh, after warming up, goblet squats, very light as well. We're talking. Thing like eight kilograms that's like i don't know 16 pounds for like something but yeah we're talking less than 20 pounds she's holding it in front of her and the first set she does eight reps not an issue and then she's like she asks me she looks at me really weirdly and even though the entire thing she's like so why am i doing this and i explained to her why she's doing this and then she goes looks at me and just okay like she looks at me as like you know it was, it was an approved answer and i'm like let's do another eight and then we did the other eight, and I think it was number four or five, boom, like something happened to her back. And then just, yeah, I, basically I got all the blame and, you know, it was my fault. And now she couldn't go hiking and I basically fucked her up. And uh, <laughs> I don't I, I felt bad about it, but again, it's like, you know, it's hard to tell where it was no pain at all. And I think it's like, I even don't think it was like even pain. I think it's like, you know, her. It, may, it might have been pain, you know, but I think honestly it would have done all over pretty quickly. Though. I don't think it was anything too serious, but it's it's a, it's it's a fine line, and then, again it goes you know back where it's like, um, you know, to the whole, like, maybe not to the whole suing thing, but it's like they can if they really want to something like that. You know, it's like where you cause them pain, and then that could lead to something else. But in reality, like what caused that could be you know a bunch of like their habits that they do outside of the gym coming there, and then like just. You know, you just happen to be at the wrong place, wrong time, and then boom, even a simple thing that wasn't supposed to do anything causes that, and then voila, like now you're the person who's being blamed. You know, so it's, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a messed up world a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you want to filter out those wishy washy clients the best you can, too. Not, not to insult her at all, but you're going to have those people where, they do deadlifts with you and then they say that they like tore a hamstring because they're sore for three days. No, you just did deadlifts for the first time in the 65 years you've been alive. So your hamstrings are going to be sore and I'd rather it be your hamstrings than your low back, to be honest with exactly. you. So we did good things. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, the, those, those are the type of people that like, 
you want to build up their mental grit. And if their mental grit just doesn't, you know, come around, referring them out to somebody else (laughs) who likes to work with that population is the way to go. I personally tried to keep my clientele, um, people who, I don't want to say I had high mental grit because you can't really quantify that, but people who recognized the soreness and were like, all right, like some level of soreness is good. Mm -hmm. And that woman, I think hard to say what she had going on in her life, but um, like you said, it could have been a lot of contributing factors that gave her the back pain. And uh, I wouldn't take that personally if I were you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Like, actually, um, on top of this, I was like, actually, ask you, um, because you mentioned about your clientele you know, with the mental grid. Do you, actually, do you ever have a client, or maybe you don't have any anymore, but, you know, say someone comes, like, they want to work with you, and then um, maybe you're like, straight off the bat, like, if you do one session with them, and just you, you, you determine for yourself, like, no, this is not for me. And would you then, would you recommend them to somebody else? Like, do you tell them to their face, like, hey, I think that you'd be better off working with this person? Or, like, you know, does that ever happen to you, kind of a situation like this? Yeah. Um, so basically where they come in and you realize during that first session that you two don't, like, click very yeah. well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was in a place of privilege, though, because... In most of the places I've worked, I had a team that liked each other. Um, if you're in a gym with other personal trainers, you want to try to build a good network with them. Like, yeah, you're all competing, but if you follow the advertising strategy that I mentioned, um, you're not like trash talking anyone. You're basically, you have the opportunity to set your style Um to call out the people that you actually want to work with because some people don't want to work with just athletes like myself. Some people want to work with uh, seniors 65 and up or, you know, something to that effect. So you're calling out those clients, but when you get somebody who wants to work with you that you didn't click with, you can say, look, I, um, I have to be honest with you. I'm not the best person for you. Uh, Like what? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Like, I I have a niche, I have an area of expertise, but like, I'm not going to, I would be doing a disservice to you to take your money if I know that there's somebody who's a better fit for you. Mm. Because we both charge the same price anyway. So why wouldn't you get everything that your money is worth with this guy? I'll give you his contact information. I'll CC you in an email. I'll get the ball rolling. I'll tell him a little bit about you. Um, But I think that he would be a better or she would be a better fit for you. Mm. And I've, I've told people that I mean, at fitness together, it's nice because it's a little studio and it's very one-on-one based. It's not a gym. So sometimes the trainer's right there. It's like, all right, Hey, you know, Leslie, here's the trainer I was telling you about. Allie, Allie's really, really great. She has tons of experience with people with low back pain or people with ski version of the ankle or, you know, don't call them out and say, hey, your personality fucking sucks. So let's uh, let's get you squared away with somebody else. So I don't have to see you ever again. You know, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> well, I was actually going to ask about that. Has there ever been a moment where, you know, say you you tell them like, I don't well, you don't say I don't want to work with you, but you can explain to them that this one is better. Have you ever had like, someone confront you, be like, no, I, I want to work with you, and then just be very stubborn and that, like, dead set on working with you? Has that ever happened? Or Yeah, you just got to stand your ground with that, and that kind of goes with firing clients as well. Um, I didn't have that opportunity at Fitness Together. Like, I, the clients technically, technically weren't ours. Um, they were Fitness Together's, music quotes here if people are listening to audio, but, um, <laughs> somewhere like LA fitness, I had to fire two clients because like we had one lady showing up 25 minutes late to a 30 minute session consistently. And we had another lady who like wanted to come in whenever she came in and just wanted me to drop whatever I was doing to train her. So those two people, I was like, look at we're like, I don't know who you want to go to, but this relationship is not, we, we can't work together. So 
unfortunately I can't train you. Mm. But you just have to have conviction when you tell them that um, and, and stand your ground because it's going to be a lot of headache for you if you don't. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, definitely, definitely. That, that's actually pretty awesome. Though. Like showing up 25 minutes late to a 30 minute session. Like. <laughs> yeah, it's like, all right, let's do 10 jumping jacks and we're done. Okay, see you later. <laughs> Dude, that's easy money though. Why not? I'll, why not take it every day? <laughs> yeah, but you also want to build your clientele so that you can use, not use them, but so that you have some sort of testimonial base or results because you don't, you have to sell yourself less and less as time goes on. If people are seeing, you know, everybody who's working with you is losing weight or what have you. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. The the one thing also that I've um, noticed is that um, I don't know how you feel, like, but I felt that um, when I was there, like at Springfield, that the things that like, you get taught is that you need to do these things. Like, well, maybe not everybody said this, but I feel like I kind of I at least took it sometimes that you need to do almost these like crazy things sometimes with your clients to help them achieve the results. But I feel that you don't really need to do this extravagant you know drills or exercises or whatever it might be like just even the simplest stuff just really basic exercises um was really well because i feel people they can't even do the most basics of the basics and then that's the thing too when i see people uh, especially like after hearing uh, pat davison's talk about uh, like uh, unstable surfaces like i've thrown that away completely because i think that people can't even do an exercise on a stable surface, now you're gonna have them do the exercise on an unstable surface. It's like it makes zero sense, you know. They rather just work on them, perfect, like getting really good at this, then start throwing even more crap on them, and just they're not getting anything. It's like it's just it's it's stupid. And I don't know. That's the thing. I feel like sometimes you know that in, at Springfield, it's kind of like this. this you get the, you, you, they teach you so much, and it's like oh, I need to do like, these crazy things, but in reality, like you don't. You just need to pick really simple stuff, especially if with gen pop, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated at all. I don't know how you feel, maybe like you like do some more crazy shit with them. I don't know, but yeah, if you want to share maybe a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like you don't have to, you don't have to end up doing like fancy exercises. Like in martial arts, we had a saying, like it, it doesn't look pretty, but it works. Mm-hmm. Like, you can follow the same template that like Dr. John Russell uses or Paul check. It's like, you know, squat, push, pull, hinge, um, carry. And, you know, Paul check, I think adds twist in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you're getting those movements, because really the human structure is the same, whether you're working with an athlete or a gen pop person, like you have the same joints pretty much like mm-hmm. they're oriented in the same direction, you know, the knees typically above the ankle. Um, so you can follow those same patterns when you enter those categories, you have a ton of different things you can do. Like they don't have to do back squat. They could do goblet squat two kettlebell front squat, like one arm overhead kettlebell squat, like depending on their movement proficiency. So you have variation within the guidelines, but yeah, it, it you want to develop proficiency enough for them to just get up and off the toilet when they're 65, like, I think that's the goal for everyone. And it doesn't have to be super fancy. I think things like PRI are great, but, um, you're not going to have a client who comes in and just wants to breathe for 10 minutes. Yeah. I was actually, the thing is, I was actually talking with, uh, Christian, you know, a very dear friend of yours. I don't like him. He's not my friend. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, we were actually talking about this where, I used to be very into PRI, you know, especially of, because of Declan, but I've kind of strayed away from it as well a little bit now where it's like, I think it's a good thing to do for sure. I'm not saying you should like stop doing it, but I feel that like kind of, you know, working yourself just like from PRI as this main focus point and, and that is just, I, it's not really that interesting to people. And to be honest, I don't really find it even that much as applicable. I think it's better. Like the, I don't know that much about it, but RPR, for example, I think it's a much better method to implement into with a client than PRI because I feel it's more applicable for them. 
compared to PRI, where it's PRI is just it's um, it's so it's like it's very really hard as well to just pinpoint on that they could actually maybe like fix it someone and puts them in the right position and stuff like that, you know, or, like yeah. So I don't want to trash talk it completely because it's a it's a good thing, but I think that people also hype it up a bit too much than what it actually deserves. Yeah, like it, it's it's the right tool if you use it at the right time and it has a lot of premise and a lot of science to back it up um but out of the gate if you're working with general population i can tell you you're going to steer people away if you have them breathe for the first 10 minutes of your session and they're also going to walk away from your session go back to doing things that put them in the position you're trying to fix in the first place Mm -hmm. so you're not really like you can learn about the complex method of PRI, but um, it's not going to amount to much if you're not using it with the right population. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. No. <laughs> I'm glad Declan's not on this podcast. Like, you would just be fucking fuming probably right now. Let's trash talking PRI. <laughs> well, I, like, like I said, I mean, I think it's a great system and it has premise to it. Um, but you have to consider that there's a biopsychosocial model and that people are spending money to work with you. If you're in the business of personal training, like that private sector area, they have a little bit of a say what goes and you also have to try and work with them to develop a, um, a want in them to work out. So per like even me, like I know the benefits of PRI, but if I hired a trainer and they had me breathe for the first 10 minutes of a 45 minute session, um, you know, like I could do that at home for one and two, like that would be so beyond boring for me that I probably wouldn't, if it was like a consistent thing, like week after week for like two months, like I'd probably stop seeing the guy to be honest with you. No, I, I definitely agree with you in that. That's like where, because I was trying to do that a little bit, but then I kind of quickly almost, as, soon, as quickly as I tried it, I, I quickly removed it because I could, I could tell immediately, like even for me, it wasn't interesting or like just, I was like I was wasting my time and their time on this because it's, I think it's better to if um, outside of it or like say after a session, if you have no other clients in between, like they're not rushing away. Then you can like spend five ten minutes, kind of maybe going through one or two things, like talking about about it, if they also are interested in it. But doing it like during their time when like you're working with them, it's better to do focus on other things because, well, as you say yourself, then they're not gonna be wanting to do it. And then if you keep doing that, even like I'd say even one session, they might not come back for a second session. It might be that that, that simple. So maybe if they come back for a second one, then you're pretty lucky, I'd say, and you should do something else. But if you do it again, then almost 100% they won't come back. Because if that's like all they're doing, like you said yourself, they can do it. You can do it all yourself at home. So it's, yeah. Yeah, like you could teach it to them once and then say, all right, so do you have any questions about it? And they're like, no. It's like, all right, three times a week, I want you to do this exercise. I mean, I've known about PRI for four years. I've been a trainer for five years going on six and I've used out of the over three, over the 400 people I've trained, I've used PRI with two. And those two people really, really needed it. I'm talking about like one of them was a lady with back pain so bad that she couldn't walk. And arguably I shouldn't have trained her because like she should have saw a professional. Yeah. Um, I did refer her out to a chiropractor and, uh, you know, I tried not to train her, but fitness together had a different agenda. So I had to train her, but, um, and then another person, she was so stressed that she couldn't actually breathe to her lung capacity. Like she was literally like shaking when she came in because she was every time because she, that's how stressed she was. Um, so I used PRI for that. No, that, that's what I mean. It's like, as we've mentioned along this, you know, it's kind of, you know, right time, right place. You know, if, if that person needs it, then you would use it with that person, that specific tool. So, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 I don't know. I still kind of go away from PRI, man, but that's just my own opinion. I just, yeah, I, I haven't really felt that. I don't really know too much about it, so I can't say like I've really, like, when I've done it, it's like, I've done it in the correct way, but yeah i don't know yeah i think the setting has to be right like 
if I went to uh, a functional medicine doctor or like a chiropractor and they were having me do PRI stuff, yeah, like I'm all for it or even physical therapy because I'm not expecting, you know, to get shredded and yoked yeah. Yeah. and to lose weight. So like I get the application in that setting. Yeah. When I go to a personal trainer and they're giving me PRI or even like um, rolling from the FMS, I don't know if you've seen like upper body rolling and lower yeah. body rolling. Yeah. Um, it's like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, dude, I, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> like Captain America is not just sitting on the ground rolling in his workouts, you know, and I'm trying to look like that guy. So uh, obviously <laughs> there, I was fooled somewhere along the line, Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a good point, man. That's a really good point. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but... Hmm. Well, you know, I have, uh, at least I have one final question for you. All right. So as I mentioned in the beginning with the goat's milk, um, is it possible, like, do you sell that stuff? Like, because maybe the listeners would want to buy something or like, kind of how, what's that look like, looking like? Yeah, I actually stole the goat when I was on the mountain. So the hike back down was harder than the hike oh. up because I was carrying all this extra weight. Okay. Yeah, and I keep him in a room with four ACs running at all times just to kind of <laughs> mimic his environment. <laughs> you know, lock the door. Okay. So, so um, but what do you feed the goat then? Like, do you have any, like, does, it, does it have like a specific diet or anything? Or do you just feed it, you know, other goats? Or like, what, what's that? Yeah. That's so sick. <laughs> Do I feed it other goats? Yeah, go to the store and buy goat meat so I can feed it to my goat, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> you might want to get checked, sir. Yeah, I think that's going to be a good idea. But, um, yeah, so I'm just gonna, I'm just going to say it for the people. So, okay, so... To summarize it, then, if we would like to buy some goat's milk, do we just contact you then, or yeah, or do we do we, still, do we have to stop by your house because it's you know maybe you'll, I don't know yeah I, I don't yeah. know what your distribution looks like. I, I don't know about goat milk, but if anybody wanted to know any more information on where my head's at at any given point in time, uh, I will have a website published by the end of this month, CavemanRx.com. And uh, I have another article coming out, but in the meantime, I have one that's out right now uh, titled It's Easy to Train Around Pain on Medium, mm. medium.com. So you can check that out. And that's pretty much a summary of everything we talked about relative to injury today. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It's, uh, it's been a while, man, since we talked last, and it's always a pleasure to see your handsome face. Uh, it was it was the pleasure's mine to see your beautiful space on my on my magnificent MacBook. So I have you in HD MI. Oh God! I have my Beats headphones in, so it's like you're whispering in my ear. This is uh, this has just been a phenomenal time. For fuck's sake, man! <laughs> <laughs> that is some very heartwarming words, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you, man. Uh, do you have any final thoughts, comments that you want to tell the listeners? Uh, I think that's everything. Just keep on listening to the podcast and uh, you're, you're going to get something out of it. I think there's a lot of podcasts that are just fluff out there. Um, but it, like I know Declan doesn't hold anything back. Some people, they tend to not give away too many or too much information because they want people to go to their sites and stuff. But like, Declan and you and uh, myself, we don't we don't try to hold back. So it, we're literally giving everything we know in all these episodes. So just keep listening. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with you on that. That you know, even Declan can like sometimes almost be too much, but I think it's like it's almost a good thing because yeah, like you were saying, yourself, most people just don't want to share too much of the information. They kind of like kind of stick it to themselves, but. Yeah, but I would like to at least, you know, thank um, the three listeners that are going to listen to this, I hope. Um, well, we have Dan, Declan's dad, Declan himself, and hopefully Zach. 
I'm not betting on TJ because that man, yeah, I've lost hope in that man. <laughs> but well, uh, Zach might not listen to, to this because it's not paleo, but if he does, then. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually that's a good point it's a good point <laughs> but uh, anyhow um, thank you once again for coming on and I'm looking forward to having you back on soon again thank you sir it's my pleasure and uh, looking forward to seeing your beautiful face again oh, thank you very much thank you well yes thank you everyone and this was us for this time bye bye